Hey guys I'm Yurizi. This story is all about what if Naruto had a quirk. A reluctant hero in training, but even the reluctant can become great, once they find their cause. Before we proceed with the story, please like and subscribe to this channel if you liked the video and don't forget to check the description for the other works of the author if you liked the story. Let's start. Chapter 53 Request Being a pro hero was far more exhausting than Naruto gave it credit for. Mentally exhausting. How do reporters get to the scenes of crimes so fast? Naruto complained as he collapsed on the couch in Ryako's office. It was soft and comfortable, and while he wasn't facing any physical exhaustion, dealing with so much publicity was just taxing on his mind. A bank robbery done by villains, a burning building with hundreds trapped inside of it, stopping a small-time robbery from happening while on patrol, preventing a suicide attempt helping the police with identifying the cause of death of a murder victim and then tracking down the killer. All of these events had happened, and each time, the second the event was resolved Naruto was suddenly surrounded by reporters who seemed to just know when and where something was happening. Ryuko sat behind her desk and smiled. Being in the shoes of a pro hero was a lot different than being a vigilante like Naruto had been doing, where he avoided the press. You know, most heroes just have their interns watch from the sidelines. Ryuko pointed out to Naruto as she pressed a small button on her desk. What was perhaps her favorite button on the desk? She had a point anyway though, if Naruto had interned with anyone else, he would have more than likely been told to just watch as the pros did the work. She knew his skills though, she trained him after all, and she knew he was able to handle most situations. The reason why she wanted him to intern under her, was so that she could give him the experience that he needed. She wanted him to experience a hands-on experience, with dealing with reporters and the press in general. Naruto making a debut as a hero, while still a first-year intern, would raise his popularity by showing just how competent he was as a hero. It was a waste not to let him do actual hero work, and as long as she was there with Naruto, he didn't need to be a pro hero, since he was her intern. Thanks for not being most heroes. Don't thank me, your potential would be wasted on the sidelines. If I believe my interns are capable, I will allow them to use their abilities where they can be useful. So, why don't you tell me what has been on your mind all day? Ryuko asked as the door opened up. She raised an eyebrow when she didn't recognize the boy who was carrying a tray that had two cups on it. She sort of recognized his looks, she had seen a similar guy before. She didn't remember employing anyone that young though to work for her. You are? Ryuko asked. Naruto looked up. You're that guy. Gara, from the business class. Naruto pointed out as he saw Gara walking into the room with two steaming hot cups of coffee on a tray. Naruto recognized him as the guy who gave him a business card, and apparently Momo won as well. He was wearing a nice suit this time though, and his super messy hair was combed very neatly to the side. Ryuko realized who this was. Ah, Raza's son he asked to allow to intern here. Thank you for bringing the coffee, and I hope you learn much while interning here. Ryuko, in full Ryukyu authority mode, spoke to Gara as he sat down the coffee on her desk. He took one of the cups, and walked over to Naruto, before handing it to him as Naruto sat up. Gara stood up straight and looked at Ryuko, before he bowed. Thank you for the opportunity. So formal, but I guess for those not in hero classes, that is kind of normal. Naruto started to pour religious amounts of milk into the coffee, and some cubes of sugar. He got up and passed the sweetened coffee to Ryuko, before he took her black coffee for himself. Gara was already out of the room, door closed behind him. Guess they didn't tell him you prefer sweet over bitter. Naruto mentioned as he sat on top of her desk, legs hanging off of it. She raised an eyebrow. My question, I would like an answer. I had hopes you would pick me but I know you well enough to know you wouldn't pick me, if you didn't have an ulterior motive for it. I taught you practically everything I know. Ryuko pointed out as she gave him a small, knowing smile. She enjoyed seeing him try and hide the guilt from his face, seeing as she had nailed the nail on the head with that one. Naruto took a breath. Why did she have to know him so well? There is a girl who is suffering in this city, that I want to save. Your office is stationed here and I knew that you were planning on letting me do real hero work. You were my best chance of saving her. 
Naruto admitted with a wince. Ryuko was like an elder sister to him, and he felt really bad that he was using her. He felt horrible for using her kindness for his own ends, but he needed to do it. He needed to do anything he could possibly do that would let him save the girl as soon as possible, and prevent any more horrible treatments to the girl herself. He didn't want to wait until it was too late, or tell the pro heroes and wait for them to get warrants, or try and do their own research into the girl before saving her. I've been having visions, in my dreams, of the future. Naruto told Ryuko, and he glanced over to her. Gone was her amusement, and she was pure serious as she looked at him. She waved her hand. Continue, but how long have these visions been happening, and how often do they happen? Ryuko didn't doubt Naruto for a second, she didn't know him to be a liar unless it was for the best. She could see it was hard for him to talk about this stuff. For a couple of weeks, and they only happened a few times at first, but now they happen every night. I see Eri suffering every night, and every time, I'm unable to do anything but watch. I know I can save her. I know where she is, I know who is keeping her. Naruto stopped when Ryuko raised a hand to stop him. You're suggesting kidnapping. Her parents are dead, and she is being experimented on and abused by people. She has no family, and she's undocumented. She has no legal guardian, technically. Also, she has scars on her arms. I've already done my research, enough of it that if a pro hero were to discover it, then they wouldn't need a warrant to hold a rescue. Naruto hated falling asleep now. So, whenever he would be sleeping, until the point he had to sleep, he stayed awake trying to do whatever it took to find a way to save Eri as soon as possible. He already figured out where she was, which was why he was interning under Ryuko. He had gotten the blueprints of the estate from the public housing records, so he knew where she was being kept in the house itself as well. But, he couldn't save her. Even if he was justified in saving her, the second he tried to become her guardian, then he would be admitting to breaking several laws and he would no longer be able to protect her. She would be returned to where she came from, and he could be blamed for hurting her. It would become moot if she was returned to the Yakuza, and all of her injuries were blamed on him. He needed the help of a pro hero to save her, so that he could avoid legal trouble, and make sure that Eri would be safe. Ryuko was impressed, but she was also upset. You plan on fighting the Yakuza alone. Ryuko frowned. I'm not going to fight if I don't have to. I want to sneak in, fake her death, and get out with her. I want her out of there, before they even realize she is gone. She's gone through too much, I don't want to force her to experience violence anymore. I want to protect her. Naruto's fists were visibly shaking in anger. Every night, he was forced to witness what they were doing to her. Every single night now, he was forced to watch, but unable to do anything for her other than watch. The girl had experienced far too much violence, so if he could get her to safety without her seeing anything violent, then all the better. Ryuko looked more closely at Naruto's body language, he had never been good at hiding that, and she could see it. She could see the pure helplessness he felt for being unable to do anything without help. To save this girl, and make sure she actually stayed saved, he was required to get help. Yet, she was still suffering every second Naruto was unable to get the help of somebody he could trust. He felt weak, unable to do anything, and he knew that most heroes would not believe him or put their careers on the line because of a student's dreams as it were. Naruto's closest hero was All Might, but because he was All Might, it was hard for the man to do stealth missions. That was the opposite of what Naruto wanted for the girl, and it would just put the girl in danger if All Might appeared. To be unable to save a person, it was killing him on the inside. If you want to save her, then go tonight. You'll be more stealthy if you go alone, but I'll write a report saying that I found probable cause, and that I was with you. Save her, and do it without getting into a fight. Ryuko spoke with an air of acceptance. Sooner or later, Naruto was going to snap and lose control of himself and push himself too far to save this girl. He had done so much work, and she already had faith in him as it were. Anyway, it sounded like this girl really did need saving, and if it was stealth, Naruto was one of the best choices for that if he knew the place as well as he was saying he did. She had never seen Naruto put so much thought into anything, usually he just wrote on instinct. Really? 
Naruto was extremely surprised when she just gave him the permission. She nodded. I trust you, and since you're my intern, I can give you the temporary legal status of a hero. You better get some rest now, because you're going to have a busy night. Ryuko told him strictly. She didn't want him tired if he was going to be risking his life. Honestly, you're such a troublesome kid. Ryuko spoke, and she tried to maintain a frown. A smile slipped on her face though. Please promise me you won't get get in over your head. Ryuko placed her hand on his shoulder. She knew that with or without her permission, he was going to do this. The only reason Naruto hadn't yet went to rescue this Eri, was because him acting too soon would put her in even more danger. Naruto gave her a grin. You know I can't make that promise. Naruto spoke to her with his grin sad. He always tried to keep his promises, and he didn't make promises he wouldn't be able to keep. He had to save her. Chapter 54 Naruto Sense Stealth Surprisingly, Naruto didn't suck at it. Considering he had to be good at hiding his tracks when he escaped from news reporters, it was common for him to know how to avoid being seen when he didn't want to be. Sneaking through the alleys, Naruto was heading towards the location where he would create the first diversion. The alley he was inside of led right to the right side of the hideout that Eri was being kept in. He would do something that would attract attention, before he quickly backtracked and went to the right location to enter the hideout from. There was a figure over there. Naruto blinked in surprise when he saw the guards ran away and called in some backup, and they passed right by him and went into a different alley. Unsure of what just happened, but not really caring to be honest, Naruto made the coincidence work for him. He looked towards the cameras, before he ran towards the wall in the blind spot, and jumped over the wall and landed on the other side, where there was another camera blind spot. For Ares' sake, he wanted to avoid any and all fighting that didn't have to happen. Now, I have to find Eri, she should be on the lowest levels. Naruto moved from shadow to shadow as he approached the mansion's outsides. He hated stealth so much. With a sigh, Naruto created a small blue flame in his hand. Tossing it into another bush, it instantly burst into flames. Quickly running as far away from the fire as possible, Naruto grinned to himself when he got into the building just as several men ran out of the building upon seeing the brightness of the flames. Their attraction to the flames diverted their attention away from him, at the perfect moment for him to get into the building. There were no cameras inside of the mansion that Naruto could see, but he knew they were there. Pulling his orange hoodie over his head, he transformed back into a human form, and let the shadows cover his face. It had been a while since he had done illegal hero work, technically what he was doing right now fell within a gray zone, since he had a pro hero's temporary status. Still, it had been a while since he saved anyone while wearing his hoodie. A door opened unexpectedly. Naruto grabbed the man that came out of the door, before he could see him, and slammed him into the wall head first. Shattering his black mask, and pushing his skill through the wall. Grabbing him, Naruto lifted the man over his shoulder and ran with him. If somebody saw the man, and woke him up, then they would know there was an intruder in the mansion. Naruto looked around, before he saw a closet and quickly and quietly stowed the villain away inside of it. The knocked out man would wake up eventually, but Naruto had bigger concerns. How the hell am I so stealthy in orange? Naruto whispered under his breath as he jumped up to the ceiling and grabbed onto it, just as two men in plague masks passed by underneath him. It was amazing to him how he was able to steeth his way around all of these people with orange being his main color. Naruto flipped down onto his feet behind the men, before he turned the corner before either of them could turn around. For the Yakuza, these men did not know much about home defense. Then again, as the Yakuza, not a lot of people tried to break into their house. Naruto reached into his hoodie, and he pulled out the blueprints to the place. He didn't have it all memorized, so Naruto continued moving as he looked at prints. He could feel a small, nervous sweat, on his brow as he ducked behind a corner and looked around it. He frowned when he saw that there wasn't a viable way around this guard, easily that was. That would make it harder to get to Eri, but wiping the nervous sweat away, Naruto shook himself of his nerves. He couldn't afford to fail, not when somebody else's life was on the line. He slapped his cheeks lightly, before he forced a smile on his face. This was the face that would greet Eri, not a nervous one. He needed to be fearless for her. 
in another location. Nightly patrols are a major part of being a hero, though, you should always save these types of patrols to only a couple of times a week. Try and set up a schedule with other local heroes, so that you can fairly divide the night work. Native spoke as he walked in front of Kyoka. He wasn't exactly happy that she was the student that he got, but when he got a letter from Class A's number one fighter, he had to accept her. They were about to turn into an alley. I don't think that is a smart idea, my Naruto sense is going off. Kyoka spoke as she looked at the alleyway with a critical eye. Pointing her jacks at the alley, she could hear light footsteps in it. Native raised an eyebrow. Naruto sense? What in the world is that? A few of us in Class A have developed a sense for when something really stupid and dangerous is going to happen. After hanging out with Naruto, we named this sense after him since dangerous situations are attracted to him, this alley is setting my Naruto sense into overdrive. Kyoko pointed her fingers at it. Her Naruto sense was telling her that if she wanted to live, she needed to avoid going into that alley. Native looked at her with a raised eyebrow. Well, while I think you're full of it, there are plenty of other places to look. Native decided that he wouldn't argue. If this girl wanted to make stories up, then he would at least humor her a little. He continued to walk, with Kyoko walking after him, making sure to avoid getting too close to the alley. She felt a really dangerous aura there, and it reminded her of Naruto when something weird happened. In the alley. That girl, she knows that boy, the real hero. A figure spoke with a smile, grinning from ear to ear. His clothes tattered, and he sheathed his sword and put his dagger away. He tightened the clothes around his eyes and where his nose would be, and he rolled his neck. The hero killer, Stain. Funny, he had planned on murdering that false hero native when he turned into the alley, but it would seem that girl had inherited something called a Naruto sense, from the true hero. That boy, Foxman or alright, it didn't matter what they called him. He was one of the two people that Stain knew of, that deserved the title of a true hero. That boy, even before he would have started school at UA, had been doing illegal hero work for years. He never sought out fame or recognition, and many times, he would get extremely hurt from his rescues to the point that most would die from it. But he just continued on, and continued to do what was right, and save lives. The boy who had saved the entire world from that supervillain now long ago. The boy who held an ideology so similar to his own. The ideology that heroes nowadays didn't deserve the title of heroes, and that only those who wanted to become heroes for the sake of others and not themselves deserved the title. That being a hero was about the challenges that came with it, and you needed the determination to keep on fighting through those challenges. Yes, he had watched the tournament, and he seen that boy fight the entire time without his quirk, challenging himself and his own convictions, to test himself. There are so many false heroes to purge in this city, but alright, he is in another city right now dash. Stain, I've come to talk with you. Menma appeared behind Stain, teleporting to Stain's location. Stain stood up straight, and drew his sword once more. Leave. Like that, his sword was at Menma's throat, just a hair away from slitting his throat. Menma just placed his hand on the sword, and teleported it away. I'll return that to you once I'm done here. The last hero you attacked, he didn't die, he's paralyzed in the hospital. Menma simply reported what happened to the last attack victim. Stain showed displeasure that the information, but he didn't seem overly emotional about it either. He wanted to kill the man. Well, paralyzed was pretty punishing. You came just to say that. No, I came to make a request. Just killing heroes won't be enough to change them. If you want to change heroes in general, you need to pressure them. You need to provide them with stronger villains, and it will breed stronger heroes to fight them, which will in turn breed even stronger villains. I would like you to keep doing what you're doing, but I've written up a list of heroes who all have quirks too weak to further the progression of strength. Menma pulled a rolled up piece of paper from his sleeve. Increase the strength of heroes, that isn't something I expected from the League of Villains. Stain accepted the paper and looked over the names. Menma gave a smirk. I don't wish to destroy heroes, my goals are similar to yours in a way. I want a world where heroes and villains are at their strongest. Those without the strength to climb to the top of the ladder, need to stay at the bottom. 
There are simply too many heroes in the world for my ideals, the sheer number of heroes is preventing the growth of villains. Menma passed by Stain and crossed his arms. A displeased frown when he thought about it. The world was so stagnant as it was now. With too many heroes, the villains were suppressed to the point that they were unable to produce any real number of significant villains. How do you benefit from this? Stain questioned as he drew his daggers and prepared to slay this teen if need be. Menma raised an eyebrow. Humanity will always seek stability, I intend to create peace, by creating a world where the strongest will be born to take command. If a villain takes the place as the strongest, the chaos will rule. If a hero is the strongest, then peace will rule, that is all I want. I want to see the symbol of evil and the symbol of peace at their strongest, and fight to the death. Menma spoke as he avoided the trash in the alley with a disgusted look. Stain thought about it, and he sheathed his daggers. Our goals are different, but this list will help me. Stain looked over the list he was given again. Menma vanished in the blink of an eye, before he appeared once more with Stain's sword in hand. He stabbed it into the ground, before he used hand sanitizer to clean his hands. Then use it, either way, your actions help me. Just keep doing what you're doing, but make sure you don't leave survivors from now on, if you show any of those false heroes of yours any mercy, then you'll lose your value to the League of Villains. Menma left his threat vague. Death would be too much of a kindness for what he had planned for Stain, if he lost his value. I wonder how you'll slay heroes without your quirk, for example. Menma asked with a growing grin on his face. Stain just walked away. He had a dream to work towards. Chapter 55 Drugs Are Bad Deep For over 30 minutes easily, Naruto had spent his time skulking around the underground layers trying to find any of the stuff that he had seen in his blueprints. While he had found several of their research rooms, and stuff that was pretty damn incriminating against them, he had also found four or five pretty powerful villains so far. Nothing he couldn't handle, each of them were rather easy to take down with a good sneak attack. Can't believe that fucker took a bite out of me. Naruto looked at his chunk of flesh that was missing from his arm. One of the villains that he had unleashed a sneak attack on, had been able to react in just enough time to get in one attack on him. He had ripped the sleeve off of his hoodie, why were his hoodies so hated by destiny, and tied it around his arm to stop the bleeding. The once orange cloth was already stained scarlet with his blood, meaning he had failed part of his mission, he had left some evidence behind that the villains would be able to use to realize who he was. Thankfully, thankfully, thanks to his being a transformation type quirk, his blood wasn't exactly easy to read for DNA scanners and the like. Naruto so wanted to snap the necks of every person he found, and it took all of his willpower to just knock them out, even though he had started to take pictures of their faces and IDs with his phone to send their information to the police and label them criminals. He had loaded his hoodie up with some weird bullets that they were making, he didn't know what it was for but he didn't like it. How much longer would it take to find her? Hey. Fuck off. Naruto was sick of these people, and the more of them he saw, the angrier they made him. This time, he slammed his fist into the man's face so hard he broke his mask into pieces, and knocked him into the metal wall hard enough to dent it. I hate this stupid stealth shit so much, calm down, calm down, don't let it get to you Naruto, you've got to smile. Naruto used his fingers to push his lips into a smile. With his smile in place, he focused his efforts on thinking about something positive. Something positive. Bang. Hard to do that right now. What the fuck? Naruto shouted as he activated his quirk and turned around. The bullets didn't destroy his quirk factor. Naruto rushed towards the man and shoulder slammed him into the wall, unkindly at that, before pushed him deeper into the now dented wall. Naruto had heard what that guy said loud and clear, and he reached behind himself and pulled the bullet out of his neck. He looked at it, and he glanced to the gun the man was holding. Ripping it out of his hands, Naruto slugged the man in the face, before dropping him to the floor. Naruto saw two more men come around the corner, both holding the same guns, and firing at him. Charging towards them, and taking the bullets head on, he smashed his way through them. Since it would seem that stealth was no longer an option, time to do things the way he truly wanted to. Power idiot coming through. If you know what is good for you, point me to Eri. 
Naruto roared as he upped his power to his two-tail form and charged down the two men. The bullets hitting him doing nothing other than feeling like pricks to his skin. She's down that hallway on the left, and take four rights, and another left, can't miss it. The man on the right shouted as he pointed, fear in his eyes. Naruto passed them. Thank you. Dude, why did you tell him that? The left man asked with a shocked look as Naruto ran by them without punching them. That dude is somehow immune to having his quirk erased by the prototype drug, meaning his quirk factor isn't inside of his body, all we have are these guns, and I don't want to die. At least, if we report him to Chisaki and collect these blood samples he left everywhere, we have a chance. The right man collapsed on his ass, holding his chest as the heart attack he thought he was going to have didn't come. Seeing that giant fox man rushing him down had been absolutely terrifying for him. With Naruto. I heard that. Naruto whispered to himself, his fox ears picking up their words easily even from a distance. Naruto reached into his hoodie, and pulled out his Hoshi no Tama, something he had brought with him for the pure sake of saving Eri. His quirk factor. Unlike other quirks, where the quirk factor was inside of the body, Naruto's quirk factor was outside of his body. It existed away from his body, so if the bullets were filled with drugs that attacked the quirk factor, then it wouldn't work on him. Seeing as his quirk wasn't actually inside his body itself, other than being in his DNA. He had always known that Monster Fox had been one of the quirks that all for one wasn't able to steal, because of the existence of his Hoshi no Tama being outside of his body. He also know that Erasure, Shota's ability, worked on him by severing his link to his Hoshi no Tama. He would have never expected the existence of his weakness would be a great strength against drugs used to destroy quirks. Monster Fox, like one for all, being one of the few quirks that couldn't be stolen by all for one had been something that Naruto had planned on using to fight said man one day. That thought, Naruto looked at the bullets and gave it a smell. It smelled like blood and human flesh. That pissed him off. Being in contact with this thing is making my mood swing. Naruto hated being in contact with what made him stronger, since it made him more likely to lose control of himself. If he wanted to be strong enough to save Eri, he needed it, so he had to have it. Here was there. Naruto saw two guards outside of Eri's secure room, both of them with guns, and the second they saw him. There were no words, no warnings, they open fired on him. This time, the bullets were actual bullets. Naruto raised his arms to cover his face, without much space to move and dodge he was peppered by them. Body slamming the first man into the door, no doubt waking Eri up, though the gunfire might have done that first, Naruto picked the man up by his face and slammed the back of his head into the second man's face. Gah. He's too dash. Now, I'll just dash, Naruto pulled back his fist, before he smashed the door open. Walking into the dark room, he could see a large bed, and sitting up with fearful eyes was Eri, just like she had appeared in his dreams. Knock a little harder than I meant to. Naruto walked into the room and found the light switch. He pulled down his hood, before he transformed back to his normal size. He was smiling. He's not the usual. Eri thought as she closed her eyes, gritting her teeth, and not looking at Naruto. Naruto sat down on the bed next to her. We don't exactly have a ton of time, before those guys come here to stop me. Still, introductions are in order, I'm Naruto Izumaki, you can call me that, or my hero name alright, or anything you want to really. Naruto placed his hand on top of her head, and he gently rubbed it. His anger faded away when saw her open her eyes in confusion. Kindness. Abused children, they were the ones who could feel kindness the most. A child who only knew her, was one of the few beings who were able to tell the difference between genuine kindness and fake kindness. It was ironic that those who experienced the most hurt, were the ones that could appreciate a simple head pat the most. The way Eri was able to look at his smile with a look that bordered on shock was sickening. You're not with them. Eri asked softly, unwilling to raise her voice. Nope, want to come with me? Naruto asked Eri as he extended his hand to her. There wasn't any hesitation when she wrapped her arms around his neck, and he used an arm to cradle her. The girl wasn't crying, laughing, or smiling, but her actions spoke louder than any answer could have. She nodded her head into his neck, and he lifted her up so that he was carrying her with one arm. 
Standing up, Naruto reached into his pocket and pulled out his Hoshi no Tama. Gently pushing it into her arms, he smiled at her with confidence. This is... Eri didn't know how to describe it. That right there, is my life. If it breaks, I die, so be sure to hold on to that really tight. You've been fighting for too long alone, well, you're not alone anymore, and you won't be alone. Now, let's get out of here. Naruto created a fox fire in his hand as he transformed. Pointing it at the ceiling, Naruto shot a line of flames through the ceiling and melted a large hole through it. He continued to shoot flames until he broke through the first layer, and then the second, and he continued to shot his flames until each and every ceiling above them was melted. Naruto felt no more resistance to his fires, so stopping, he looked up and saw the sky in the distance. He would have liked to be able to do this to go down, but that would have been too dangerous, he might have hit Eri with his flames. So pretty. Eri whispered when she saw the shining blue flames. Naruto nodded. Yep, now let's get out of here, you ever dream of flying dash? You think I'll let her or you go? So you're Chisaki, see that man Eri, he thinks he can stop me from saving you. Well, you know what I say to that. Naruto asked Eri, and she just looked at Chisaki with fear. She tried to struggle out of Naruto's arm to return to the man, but Naruto held her tight, knowing why she was trying to escape. Chisaki saw Naruto not let her go, and Naruto looked towards Chisaki with a grin. I say dash. You are not leaving alive. Chisaki rushed after Naruto. I say, you lose. Naruto jumped and used his free hand to shoot fox fire at the ground, shooting him through the hole in the ceiling before Chisaki could reach him. Naruto grinned when he saw Eri's shocked expression. In no time at all, they reached the top floor, before shooting out of the mansion and into the sky. Naruto didn't mention the fact that this was his first time using his flames to fly alone, was not the time to doubt himself. Eri breathed. She tasted the fresh air as Naruto changed directions, and started to fly them at speeds that Chisaki and the Yakuza would be completely unable to follow them. Naruto took them above the clouds for cover looking up at the stars for his map. He couldn't take her back to Ryako's office, that was the first place that they would look for her after having seen his quirk in action. Eri was silent though as she was carried, almost as if she didn't believe what had just happened, and to be honest, he didn't blame her. The pains she must have gone through, her bandaged arms and legs. He might have saved her body, but he hadn't saved her heart yet, and that was a long road before she was truly rescued. In the hideout, he got away, he took Eri. Chisaki's eyes were narrowed in anger as he looked at the melted ceiling that had been used to escape. Sir, we got blood samples from him. Chisaki killed the man that spoke, leaving the man next to him sweating in terror. Gather any and all DNA of that man you find in this base. Chisaki ordered with a growl, he hated losing, and having his weapon stolen from him like this, it left a bitter taste in his mouth. They needed to create a new weapon. Maybe I can be of some assistance. Chapter 56 Todoroki Ow, ow, ow. Stop hitting me. Naruto's shouts were heard in the small hours of the morning as he sat in front of Recovery Girl, the woman had refused to heal him after his stunt this time. Instead, all she did was remove the bullets from his body and stitch him up. She was letting him deal with his arm in the damaged state it was in for the rest of the internship, as his punishment for acting so foolishly on his own. Now, she was hitting him on top of the head with her cane, his arm in a sling and bullet wounds all over his body that were now stitched up. Foolish child, do you have no value for your own life? Recovery girl kept beating him over the head. If he wasn't him, these bullets would have been far more fatal than they were. He had lost an impressive amount of blood, and had gotten himself on the bad side of a group of villains, but at least that last one was P.A.R. for the hero course. Becoming a hero meant being on the bad side of the villains anyway, so at the very least, she could forgive that one. Well, it's a good thing I'm alright now, thanks for healing me. Naruto said, even though she didn't use her quirk, she had applied modern medicine to his wounds anyway, which would help him still. Not as well as her quirk would, but he would be back on his feet in no time, heck, he could still fight as he was. He didn't need both of his arms to fight villains. Anyway. Eri needed me, so I had to be there for her. Naruto placed his hand on Eri's head. 
she had fallen asleep in his lap, having refused to leave his side. No doubt, she feared she would wake up and be back with Chisaki. That girl has no medical records, and no real birth certificate, thankfully, I'm able make those for her. You're just a child yourself, do you think you're Dash? She is my responsibility, and I'm old enough to become a legal guardian now. I have a decent bank account, can pass background checks, have viable personal references, and I'm the hero who rescued her. Naruto spoke gently, careful not to wake Eri up. Since when he saved Eri, he had been a temporary hero thanks to Ryuko giving him legal permission to act the part of the hero, he could file to take this orphaned child into his custody seeing as he had saved her. Also, if she is with me, then she will be at UA, and with all the pros here. She'll be safe, and she won't have to suffer those pains anymore. Naruto could see the horn on Eri's head, and it seemed a little smaller than when he first met her in person. The girl had taken to him, and had become comfortable in his kindness being genuine, which helped build a bond of trust with her. Her childhood will be a lonely one, without children her own age. Recovery girl pointed out, and Naruto grinned. Once she is older, she'll meet people who will accept her. I didn't have anyone my own age either, but I don't hate my childhood. I just want her to have a better childhood than she would have had. I'll even drop out of UA if I have to. Naruto mentioned with a deep sigh. If he had to give up becoming a legal hero to keep her safe, he would do what he had to do. He had to take responsibility for saving her, meaning he had to do whatever it took to do that. If he had to give up his dreams as the consequence, then so be it. He hoped it wouldn't come to that though. The door opened. NARU dash. SSSSSHHHHHHH. Naruto raised a finger to his lips. He was surprised to see Sir Naitai of all people coming into the office with a surprised face, upon seeing Naruto sitting with Eri, alive and well apparently. Seriously sir asshole, there is a sleeping kid. Naruto grinned and winked at him. Sir Naitai was visibly surprised. You're not dead, but when I saw your future a year ago, I saw you dying too, you actually rescued her, and didn't die trying. Sir Naitai was surprised when he looked and saw that Eri was sleeping safely on Naruto's lap. Naruto just picked Eri up gently and cradled her against his shoulder, before he walked towards Sir Naitai and placed a hand on his shoulder, patting it. Sir Asshole was not meant to be an insulting nickname from him. This is the first time I'm hearing about this, but thanks for coming. While you're here, you should catch up with my uncle. Naruto stated as he passed him by. He was going to go to Mina's room while she was at her internship, and borrow her bed to let Eri sleep in. The girl certainly deserved to have a nice good sleep. Yawning, he realized he hadn't really slept much either. I think I'll join you. Naruto joked to himself. Wait, since they were all in the dorms, then that meant Mina was in her dorm room right now, most likely getting ready to start her second day of her internship. While he wanted Eri to get to know a lot of people, Introducing her to everyone so quickly might just push her into becoming even more shy. Mina was not great at keeping things quiet, so he needed to go to a different. I have a room, man, I'm tired. Naruto whispered to himself. Not getting a good night's sleep in weeks, and staying up all night, did not a good combination make. The dorms minutes later. Listen, Naruto, I know you don't like me. Todoroki spoke as he had his back against Naruto's door. He knew Naruto woke up early in the morning to work out, and he had really great hearing. I heard what you told Bakugo at the tournament, and it really got me thinking. I want to be a hero, but I don't know if I'll ever be able to use my fire side without feeling like it's my father's power. Todoroki spoke through the door. He had been working on this for a while now, since Naruto had lectured Bakugo to be honest. He had even taken up an internship under his father, to see if he would be able to get past his anger with his father, but honestly that didn't work out so well. He still could not see himself forgiving his father easily, or ever at all. Naruto's words had really gotten to him, and they had not even been intended for him in the first place. They had been intended for Bakugo, not him. After everything his father did. I know I've been cold to the others, and ignored everyone, but I want to change. I just don't know how to do it. If you have any advice, I want to try hearing it. I don't want to be consumed by anger anymore. 
Todoroki had trouble saying all of that, but it needed to be said. There was no answer to his statement s. I know you're in there dash. Todoroki, you're blocking my way. Naruto spoke up as he looked down at Todoroki, who was blocking his way into his room. Todoroki looked up. How much of all of that did you, little girl? Todoroki didn't know what to say when Naruto opened his door and walked in. Shark jumped towards Naruto as he closed the door behind him. Patting Shark on the nose, Naruto yawned and was glad to see that Shark was taking to his training so well. Since he had gotten rid of his bed to make room, he went to his closet and pulled out his futon with one hand. Rolling it out onto the middle of the floor, Naruto placed a few extra pillows on it for Eri, and gently laid her down, before he covered her up with a blanket. Laying down next to her, on top of the blanket, Naruto felt Shark lay down on his other side and curl. What was Todoroki doing outside of his room? Balancing school and Eri is going to be hard, but I'll make it work somehow. I have to make it work. Naruto thought as he pat Eri on the head, and scratched Shark behind the gills. He hoped that Eri wouldn't scream when she woke up and saw his pet, since that would be pretty nasty of a way to wake up. He was going to have to go to his internship later in the day, but he was sure Ryuko would understand why he was late. He had to explain everything to Eri, and get her introduced to Shark. This girl is important Shark, it's up to you to protect her when I'm gone. Naruto spoke gently as he got the attention of Shark. Wait. What was Toradoki doing outside of his room? Chapter 57 How to Summon a Villain Kyoko was bored. Five days. Five days into her internship, and she had done a great amount of nothing. She followed Native, watched as he took down some petty thieves who tried to steal from an old woman. That one incident had maybe been the highlight of anything that she had done, watch him beat up some thugs. She was nearly done with her internship, and she had only learned a few things about protocols, stuff that she could learn about in school. She had thought that she would be getting some action, maybe make something of a name for herself. She wasn't the only one. Only Naruto and Todoroki had been allowed by their pro heroes to do hero work, and both of them were interning under members of the top ten. Look at me, I'll all right. Seriously, those stores really did not take their time transforming their Foxman merch into all right merch. Kyoko watched as a father took his daughter, who was dressed up with a white cape and a fox mask, onto his shoulders and smiled up at her. The girl had an alright action figure, she seemed like a bit of a tomboy. No, I'm alright. Do either of you want to be native? Native asked when he saw what was happening. There was a boy, big brother to the girl, who was walking next to the father. He was dressed similar, but he had a fox man t-shirt on, in pink. The super cool native, who patrols the streets at night. Native explained who he was with a friendly smile. Who? Ow. Kyoko winced when she saw Native's spirit get crushed. Being less popular than a student, who wasn't even a pro yet, must have really stung his ego. The fact that Naruto already had a rather widespread fan base thanks to his vigilante work before he came to UA, and the fact that nearly every day of his internship he had made the news thanks to his heroic exploits under Ryukyu. Native wasn't even in the double digits in popularity, he was in the high hundreds, between 900 and 1000 to be honest. He wasn't popular by any stretch of the word, you were more likely to find a MT. Lady figure than you were to find a native t-shirt. That was saying something, since most heroes had t-shirts, while only popular heroes had companies make figures for them. Are you going to be okay? Kyoko pat his shoulder. He looked like he wanted to cry. This makes me glad you're my intern, he would have just made me look bad. I really don't like heroes who have those really flashy quirks, make us little guys look bad. Native complained under his breath. She didn't say anything in response to that. Naruto, in the past few days, has completed over several hundred rescues from building fires, villain incidents, and has taken down several new villain groups alone, even Todoroki has taken down some villains by himself. Makes me wish I had flashy quirks like them. Kyoka could understand where he was coming from. She had a few classmates who had those super cool quirks, but at least she had a flashy quirk too, unlike Kirishima and Toru. It would be really hard for those two to get noticed with their quirks, so she counted herself luckier than them. Do you think I can fight a villain today? 
Kyoko asked Native as politely as she could. Hopefully, her politeness would win him over, and get him to consider it. You're just an intern, interns don't get to actually fight villains, most interns don't. Native corrected himself when he looked back at the children with their father, who were still arguing over who had to be alright. Damn kids. Why was that student so much more popular than him? With Naruto. I'm alright, but these villains aren't. Naruto shouted out as he stood on top of a couple of knocked out villains, a large wound on his bicep from where one of them had thrown a car at a crowd of people. He had used his shoulder to knock it away safely, but he had gotten a gash on his arm for his effort, a metal shard stabbing him. Just because he was taking care of Eri, didn't mean he could skip his internship either. At the moment, Eri was with Shark, watching Naruto's internship take place. The girl was wearing his hoodie, with it pulled up over her head. It was large enough that she was able to wear it like a dress, and Shark was walking around on bare arms and legs today. He's her, he saved people. Eri thought as she looked at the people that Naruto saved running towards him. Naruto had knocked out the bad guys, saved everyone in danger, and had done so at his own expense. Everyone was avoiding her, well they were avoiding Shark, who snapped at anyone who tried to get too close to her. She had her own personal guard Shark, since Naruto had tasked his pet with protecting her while he did hero work. You did well alright, that is the third time today. Nice use of your catchphrase. Ryukyu clapped her hands slowly, not sarcastically in the slightest, with a nod of appreciation. Heroes who were able to make jokes, or had catchphrases were usually able to lighten the mood after a villain attack. It helped people like them, and built a certain trust that those heroes would be able to beat the villains. So far, there were few heroes who were able to do that. She was not one of them, she had no catchphrases or jokes she knew of, so she just retained a friendly and serious disposition, to let everyone know that she would do whatever it took to keep them safe. Come on Shark, there is more to do. Naruto spoke as he lifted Eri off of him, and placed her on his shoulder. What do you want for lunch? Naruto started to jog away from the scene, leaving reporters behind, he completely forgot that he wasn't a vigilante anymore. Ryukyu jogged behind him, thinking about what she wanted to eat. She had no clue. With Kyoka. Well, looks like he did it again. Kyoko looked at the news report on a TV in a shop. This added to yet another heroic deed that Naruto had done, and it would only increase his hero reputation further. Too bad, if you were the hero who trained an intern capable of handling villains, it might make you more popular. Kyoko mentioned in passing as she walked down the side of the road. Native thought on it. Okay, but only if it is one villain, and they aren't too powerful. Native liked the sound of her words. Kyoko pumped her fist. Thanks Naruto, you're welcome Kyoka, I was just doing what a decent person does Naruto. Kyoka, instead of a response, started talking to herself. She thanked Naruto, not Native, before she responded to her own thanks in a more gruff voice, before switching back to her regular voice. Don't worry Kyoka there aren't any villains around, are you sure Naruto, if any appear I'll protect you Kyoka. Kyoka continued talking to herself like a lunatic. Native had second thoughts. What are you dash? Okay fuck tards, don't make me use this flute. It worked. I can't believe that worked. Kyoka had decided to pretend to be talking with Naruto, to try and abuse Naruto's bad luck and summon a villain to herself. The Naruto factor of Naruto summoning villains to his very existence had been played in her favor this time. All she had to do was talk to herself, and pretend to be Naruto and she activated the Naruto factor for herself. Naruto had such the presence of a main protagonist that she had been able to summon a villain to herself by just acting like Naruto was with her. I wonder if Naruto knows about. Time to make the name Earphone Jack known. Kyoka grinned to herself as she extended her ears and plugged them into the back of her stereo boots. She was ready to fight at a moment's notice. The villain she walked up to fight was a red-haired girl about her own age, wearing punk rock clothing, with a very petite figure just like her own, and slanted eyes. This was a music-loving girl using a flute as a weapon, with almost no boobs and slanted eyes. Kyoko felt a sort of kinship with that girl's appearance, but she cracked her knuckles uselessly and prepared to fight. This was her chance. 
The girl started to play the flute. Kyoko froze in place completely, as did everyone within a 20-foot radius of the girl. Everyone around the girl, those frozen, started to walk towards the girl while pulling out their money from their purses and wallets. Even Kyoko found herself pulling out all the money she had on her, not that much to be honest, and walking to the girl. Kyoko unleashed a large burst of sound from her boots, her enhanced heartbeat, and for a moment she drowned out the flute sounds. Everyone's control returned to their bodies after a moment, and the girl clicked her teeth in annoyance. That girl has a sound quirk, fucking cunt, you trying to drown out my music with your shit? Take so of this. The girl shouted out, before she visibly calmed down and started to play her flute. Kyoko froze again. This time, the entire world around her turned blood red, and her body was forced to take up cross position. She was able to glance to the sides, and saw her arms were bound by strings. Her arms started to melt. Ah, 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 ah. Kyoka screamed in horror, before she actually felt the pain of her arm being melted off. My quirk is demon flute. I can confuse the five senses of anyone who hears my melody. The only thing that can beat my quirk is true pain, and drowning out my sound, but it's not like anyone can hear me. The girl spoke as she looked at everyone. She had frozen the entire crowd, and all of them were screaming in pain. The girl was making sure to use her lips to blow a whistle, to keep them trapped in her trick. She started to walk around, before she grabbed the wallets and purses from the ground. Sadly, without using her flute, her tricks were a lot weaker, so it would fade away quicker as well. Kyoka used her earphone jack, and stabbed herself in the back of the leg. Too bad for you, but you didn't confuse my earphone jacks. I heard all of that. Kyoka thought as she snapped herself out of the illusion. She started to walk up behind the girl, before she plugged both of her jacks into her boots. She brought her thumb up to her mouth and she applied pressure to it with her teeth, enough to draw blood and keep her in pain. That way she wouldn't fall prey to the sounds again. Full power. With all of her heart, literally, she unleashed the strongest form of her heartbeat. Hyper amplified, she unleashed it when she was a few feet away from the girl. She was knocked forward by the shock, covering her ears as Kyoka smacked her flute out of her hand. Pushing the girl to the ground, everyone was released from the illusions they were being shown. Kyoka pulled both of the girl's hands behind her back, before she grabbed the flute from the ground and threw it as far away as she was able to. What would Naruto do right now? Looks like I heart beat you to the punch. Your, that was horrible. That was a horrible pun, and I hate that was what I said as I arrested you. Kyoko whispered to herself with flushed red cheeks. The first thing that came to her head, just so happened to be extremely corny. Naruto's catchphrase was cool, badass, and made to let people know that he was okay, so they would be okay. It was a way to reassure himself and others that he had the situation under control, while also threatening the villain with bodily harm to lower their fighting spirit. Her catchphrase was, a lame pun. She was so embarrassed right now. Chapter 58 Weight of Burden Shy. She truly is a very quiet child, she is starkly different than Naruto was. Ryuko thought as she looked at the child, just quietly smiling and eating the sliced apple, her favorite food apparently. As much as Ryuko didn't like the fact that she had a quirk-wielding shark behind her, the beast had apparently been trained by Naruto himself into not attaching those he deems friendly. The shark just circled around Eri on the couch, which was even creepier since the shark had bare arms and legs, the shark's go-to use for its quirk. When did it even get bare DNA? What was Naruto feeding this bear? Where did Naruto go? Eri asked quietly as she glanced up at the pretty woman watching over her. Eri looked at the woman's arms, and then at her own unbandaged arms and the scars on them. She saw that the woman's skin was completely flawless, with the exception of a single scar that was barely visible on her shoulder, peeking out from her clothes just barely. Ryuko couldn't answer that question. He didn't tell me dash. I'm back. Naruto shouted out as he came back into the room. Gara had opened the door for him, before Naruto walked into the room and the door was closed behind him. Let me tell you, I would have been back two hours ago, but there was this incident, the volcano thieves broke out of jail, it was a thing. Naruto explained as he raised a shopping back that was slightly black, where it had almost gotten melted. The heat had turned the plastic bags black in some spots, 
but the items inside her unscathed, which was all that really mattered. Eri got off of the couch and walked over to Naruto, before she reached up and grabbed onto his pants. Ryuko smiled. He's like her safety blanket, they've been together for not even a full week, and he might as well be her father. I should give my father a call. Ryuko made a mental note to herself that she needed to call her parents soon. It had been a while, close to three months, since she had contacted either of them. So, where did you go? Ryuko questioned him as Naruto sat down, with Eri sitting down again, on the couch. Naruto pulled some children's clothes out of the bag, and gave it to Eri. These are for you, my hoodies are just no good. Look. I even got you a ribbon for your horn dash Naruto showed off the bright orange, he couldn't resist the color, ribbon as he showed it off to her. He reached down and started to tie it into a bow, right around her horn so that only a small amount of her horn was visible. She didn't really like her horn, so Naruto figured that she might come to accept it if he made it cuter. Naruto showed her a pair of dark blue pants, and he had gotten her a short-sleeved white and pink striped t-shirt. Also, to answer your question, I went to finish filing the paperwork to add Eri to my family registry. You're now officially Eri Namikaze. Naruto explained as he helped Eri get changed into her new clothes. He nodded at Ryuko, who blinked in a little confusion. Namikaze? Your last name is Uzumaki, why not let her have that one? He doesn't want anyone knowing I'm related to, Eri started to think, before Naruto started to answer Ryuko. Well duh. Naruto could see that his reason wasn't as obvious when he was given confused looks. To protect her from my mom's bad reputation, among pro heroes, the name Uzumaki is kind of a target that says, I have a dangerous quirk, fear me, and I want you to avoid being looked at by people the way I was. Naruto explained as he rubbed the top of Eri's head. He wanted to make her childhood as good as he could make it. He knew he wasn't going to be the perfect guardian, but he wanted to do as good of a job raising her as he could. If he could make her into a decent adult, then he would have done his job properly. Eri silenced her dark mental thoughts, she should have known he was doing it to help her. Tomorrow, you will be ending your internship, though, with your rise in popularity, you might be pressured to graduate early. Ryuko was honest when she thought that she kind of wanted Naruto to skip ahead and graduate. Naruto laughed. Nope. The me a few weeks ago might have liked that, but right now UA is the safest place for Eri. I've already talked with Nizu, and he agreed to let Eri have her own room in the female dorm rooms, provided that I pay rent to the school for her. Naruto had already been able to secure Eri her own room. Sure, since she wasn't a student he needed to pay for her to stay there, but she couldn't just stay in his room. In three years time, she would grow bigger and require her own space. Recovery Girl had promised that while he was at classes, that Eri was perfectly fine to stay with her and receive a basic education from the elderly woman. Eri needed to learn, so while Naruto was learning the ins and outs of hero work, Eri would be with Recovery Girl learning her basic education, that way when the time came, she would be able to attend school like a normal girl. Once Naruto was a well-known enough hero, that nobody in their right minds would even try and mess with her, for fear of incurring his wrath. My scars are proof that you're a strong girl, and that you've survived something that most people wouldn't dream of. They're an important part of you, but if you want, I'll go buy some black arm sleeves to wear over there. Naruto could see her internal struggle. She shook her head. He's already done so much for me, I can't ask for more. Well, I'll be back as soon as I can, Eri wants to cover her scars. If you need something Eri, you can be honest with me and as long as I don't think it will be bad for you, I'll try to get it, if I can at least. Naruto practically read her mind. There was no way the girl would actually ask him for anything. He had done a lot for her, and she was a very respectful little girl. That worked against her, since she wasn't prepared to ask for anything of him. He was going to have to really coax her requests out of her, but hopefully she would become a little more honest and comfortable in the future. She still wasn't used to somebody treating her like a child, in a good way. A person who would protect her, as an adult should protect a child, and provide love and care for her. Naruto was out the door just like that. I still don't know what to say to her. Ryuko wasn't good at this kind of thing. Naruto as a child had been open and accepting, as well as highly energetic, 
so he was a child that had been super easy for her to talk with. He had been a driven child, who trained towards his goal, and would actually need her to step in and stop him from killing himself training. Ari was a quiet, humble child that seemed to be content with just thinking to herself. While she spoke with Naruto, she didn't really talk or trust anyone else yet. The way he eyes sparkled when he was in the room, and the way they dulled when he left the room, hurt her to see. Naruto had become the shining light in her life, the one who saved this child from a dark fate. When Naruto was a child, I taught him how to do simple math. Ryuko tried to tell a story about Naruto. It wasn't really so much of a story, as it was her stating a fact, which made the awkward silence a little more awkward for her. Why is he doing so much for me? Eri asked with a voice just shy of a whisper. He's Naruto, he follows his gut, and personally, I think Naruto sees himself in you. Your life is what Naruto could have gone through, if his uncle hadn't had adopted you, and he wants to give you a better life. Naruto's mother lost control of her quirk, and hurt a lot of people, and Naruto was sort of punished for it in a way. He couldn't have a normal childhood, and he was forced to bear the burden of proving he wasn't like her, children aren't their parents, but Naruto was forced to bear sins that weren't his. Ryuko thought on him. Naruto was so used to taking everything onto his shoulders. The problems of others, physical injuries, emotional problems, and a myriad of other issues that he shouldn't have to deal with. Eri just glanced at her, before she looked back down. He's trying to make me feel all better. Eri spoke under her breath. You know, he might be doing this for you, but you might be what he needs to. Naruto is really open, but Naruto is the type to bottle up all of his issues to help others. Maybe you'll be able to do what everyone else has failed at, and soothe the beast inside of him. Ryuko hinted to the girl. Eri looked up, and she nodded her head in agreement. Maybe show Naruto your prettiest smile when he gets back. If you want to thank him. Ryuko stretched her cheeks into a forced smile to show it off. Eri looked at her teeth, surprised at how sharp they were. She looked at Shark, and compared the two. Good Shark, good boy. Eri just silently pet the shark on the gills. She wondered when Naruto would be back. With Naruto. Seriously, I just want to go shopping, my internship is nearly over. Naruto said, before he was punched in the jaw and sent flying through the air, right through a glass window, and into a toy store. Naruto groaned and rubbed his jaw, before he opened his eyes and saw a toy version of him. Wow, this is a pretty good replica. Naruto stated as he looked at it. Hey clerk, how much is this? Naruto asked as he got up and jumped out the window, towards the villain that had given him that punch. He had a strength-enhancing quirk. Oh, a villain that knew martial arts as well. Naruto engaged in close quarters hand-to-hand -hand against his opponent, ducking underneath a blow meant for his nose, before he turned around and elbowed him in the gut. When he bent over, Naruto grabbed his head and slammed him into the ground. The second he hit the ground, Naruto followed up with a strong blow to the middle of the chest. Standing up, Naruto dusted himself off, before he looked around for his shopping cart. Boom. Time to get to work. Naruto cracked his neck, before he looked towards a villain who had flamethrowers, five of them, coming out of his left arm. This kind of villain was usually the type that were rejected by society, and turned to villainy because of those reasons, so Naruto wasn't going to hurt him too much more than he needed to. He was really having a busy week. Chapter 59 Heroes Across Time Almost done. I'm almost finished it. A nervous man spoke as he pulled his hooded cloak up to cover his face. His eyes quickly glanced all around him, since he was on the run and heroes were currently tracking him even as he spoke. In his hands was a small invention, not something he himself invented, but something that he had found and was hoping to use once he fixed it invention by one of the greatest support scientists there ever was. If he fixed it, then he would be able to amplify his quirk to a great many times what he was normally capable of. I think he went this way. Shit. I have to hurry, or they'll beat me and destroy this. The man whispered to himself as he pulled the invention into his cloak to hide it. He looked out the window, and saw several pro heroes run by the building he was in. Don't worry, you'll only hurt for a second, then you'll be like me dash. Shit. The man turned around and saw a young girl standing at in the doorway, 
looking towards him with a wide grin on her face. He didn't recognize her as a pro hero, no, he recognized her as a rising star. The girl looked about 16 years old, about the age of a student of UA, and she was wearing a spandex suit that had no sleeves. Her suit was tight and form-fitting, and it was black with a red medical symbol on her chest. She had scars on her arms, and she wore two yellow boxing gloves on her fists. Her silver hair was pulled back into a ponytail, and she had a pink ribbon hanging from the front of her head. She had a black mask around her eyes, with the color of her eyes blanked out. She had an orange utility belt hanging loosely from her waist, and bright yellow boots on her feet. Hanging from her shoulders, was a large white cape with the kanji for, support the heart, going down the back of it. All better. All better spoke as she raised her fists up, and hopped from foot to foot. Turning around, the man jumped out the window and started to make a run for it. He continued to work on the invention in his hands, with his longer legs, he would be able to outrun her for sure. This world is too unfair. He shouted with tearful eyes, unable to handle as he was chased down by freaking all better. Where is all right? He looked around everywhere for the biggest threat to himself. The girl was a UA student doing her internships, she wasn't a real threat to him. If she had all in her name, then there was no doubt in his mind that she was either trained by All Might or All Right. If she had, and she was a student, then one of those two had to be somewhere close by. He turned the corner, and there she was. She raised a hand and waved to him. Hi, I might not look it, but I'm pretty fast. You're not going to get away, you might as well just give up. All better crossed her arms and gave a cheerful smile at him. She would really prefer if he could give up without a fight. Peaceful solutions were honestly the best thing there was. Or, I can try out a my new attack on you, and he ran away again. All better gave a small giggle when she saw the man turn around and continue to run. Such a cowardly villain. Very well, she would give chase. With the man. Heroes are so scary. If only I was stronger. I would be able to beat her. If only this invention the man stopped when he looked at the invention, and a small red light came on. His face lit up, and he put the device on the back of his head, with it latching onto his skull. Prepare to piss yourself little girl, I'm about to show you what's what. The man screamed at the top of his lungs. All better jumped down from the top of a building next to him. She was grinning. Very well, let's see what you got. That is some split personality you have, don't worry though, with medical treatment, you could be like me. All better. Wait. I already used my name once this fight, don't want to overdo it. All better reminded herself. Well, as long as she didn't go over three times, it would still sound cool in this fight. She had one more use of her name, before it would get old for the day. Now, where has my intern gone? Leaving your pro behind just isn't all right. The man's confidence changed into fear once more when he heard that booming voice. He looked up, and sitting down on a nearby car, was a terrifying existence for him. Grinning from ear to ear, was a tall fox figure, with a familiar grin. He started to sweat nervously as he backed up. He was screwed. I'm sorry all right, I thought it would be okay. I wanted to make a good first impression as a hero. A let you dash all better was interrupted when all right got off of the car, and landed next to her. He placed a hand on her shoulder, before he grinned down at her. The difference in their size was extremely noticeable, as was the similarities in their costumes. It's fine, you started it, you get to finish it. Make this situation all better. All right winked at her, perfectly comfortable allowing her to handle this villain. Just like that, the villain's confidence was returned to him. Fine then. With this quirk amplifier, I'll use my quirk, fast forward flash. Rewinding smash. All better shouted as her pink ribbon shined brightly, and she rushed towards the villain. He created a small orb in his hands, and prepared to throw it at her. She pulled her fist back, and she grinned her fighting grin. She punched his attack. There was a bright light. Chapter 60 Heroes Across Time Part 1 This is your room now Eri. Holding her hand, Naruto walked her down the girls' dorms and showed her, her very own room in the dorms. He had tried his hardest to pick out good furniture that she would be able to appreciate, but it was a little hard for him. 
Since Shark was going to be staying with her, as her comfort animal and bodyguard, he even placed an overly large dog bed in the corner of the room. At this point, Shark was more dog when it came to personality than real Shark, with a touch of bear personality mixed in. He got some pretty normal furniture to be honest, but he had made sure to pick out a light pink color for the sheets and pillows, with apples on them for designs since she liked that food the most. Now, he wasn't one to judge her, but he kind of wished she would love ramen a little more, again, he wasn't going to push his favorite on her. He was him, and she was she. I don't stay with you. Ari asked with a noticeably sad tone to her voice. I'll be just down the hall in the boys' dorms if you need me for anything. Don't worry, I'll never be far away. If anything worries you, or makes you scared to be alone, I'll be right there to make you all better. Naruto rubbed the top of her head. Being the first back before the others had a few perks, since he needed to introduce Eri to everyone eventually. He had gotten the chance to let Eri get used to her own room, that wasn't a reminder of her horrible past, in a way that would feel natural for her. This would give him the time to come up with an excuse for why he hadn't visited his girlfriend, despite them living in the same building, all week long. He would also be able to investigate why everyone seemed to be hiding some kind of secret from him, and whispering to each other in secrecy in general. He hated being left out on secrets. You'll make me all better. Eri whispered as she was walked into the room, and Naruto sat on her bed, and motioned for her to join him. Now, I do want to go over what you'll be doing during the days from now on. Naruto started off. Eri wasn't just going to be sitting around, doing nothing either. She was six years old, that was old enough for her to attend school herself. She couldn't do that of course, but this was a school. There existed teachers that could give her an education until it was safe for her to go to a school for kids her age. He wasn't exactly the greatest teacher, so it was the one thing he would really, truly, need help with when it came to her. He didn't want the girl to turn into an idiot, all because he wasn't able to teach her properly. If she became an idiot, then he wanted it to be because that was what she chose to be. In Mina's room. Oh my god. That week was boring. Mina yawned, tired from the sheer lack of anything that happened. All she did, much to her annoyance, was go on patrols with her hero. She didn't even see her hero fight or anything, just patrols and lectures, and more patrols. Yet, Naruto, Todoroki, Tsuyu, and even Kyoka all had villain encounters that made it to the news. Mina smiled to herself. It wasn't a total waste though, she patrolled in the mall too, which gave her the chance to buy something for herself that she just found so adorable. The cutest, most adorable, fox plushie of her boyfriend that she had found. It was a two foot tall chiba plushie of Naruto as all right, including a cute little cape and everything. In this fast paced world of heroes, where popularity is always changing, Malls and toy companies learned to rather instantly market the toys of any rising star hero that they could find in the news. Usually, it wouldn't even be a few days before the popular new heroes had plush toy lines or posters made of them. Since Naruto was already super popular as Fox Man, officially coming out as All Right had reignited his popularity, and even raised it further when people compared All Right to All Might and found their similarities. All Right, the next generation symbol of peace, was what people were calling him, comparing him to All Might. Mina closed her eyes, and allowed her hand to drift down her stomach. Hey Mina Dash. Nothing. Hey Kyoka, what you need, ha 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 ha. Mina shouted with a forced grin on her face. She removed her hand from her stomach as quickly as she could, sitting straight up in her bed, a nervous sweat on her face. She looked at her open door, and realized that she had forgotten to close it behind her when she entered the room. What was worse, was the fact that she knew that Kyoka didn't do anything wrong. She had not been paying attention, and had almost gotten caught taking care of her human needs herself. Kyoka, thankfully, didn't notice what she had been about to do, and just waved a hand at her. Some of us are getting together, to thank Naruto, for helping us get really good internships. We were thinking of putting together a small party, before we go back to class tomorrow. He's been running himself ragged for us, so it would be really nice if we could get your help. Kyoko put her hands together. It was all she could think to do to thank Naruto, gather all of the students in their class who had been helped in one way or another by Naruto, 
and just throw a small party to show their appreciation for all the work he put into helping all of them. Mina blinked and tilted her head. I'm okay with helping and it sounds like fun, but Naruto wouldn't want you to thank him. He is happy to help his friends. Mina pointed out as she stood up. Kirishima came into the room. Oh, I told her, but honestly, the guy has been really stressed out. Naruto is your boyfriend, he helped me and Kyoka train, he started getting up early and running with Tsuyu, he gives Deku tips, he's been working out with Ajiro with his tail, and he still makes sure to study with Yeyorozo two or three nights a week, and now he has even more stress in his life, dude really needs this party to lighten up. He's nearly died a few times this year as well. Kirishima pointed out as he walked next to Kyoka. I got permission from midnight to use the pool, and set up a grill, she said it was fine as long as we didn't do anything she wouldn't do. Kirishima pointed out, then he shivered. Midnight didn't exactly have the best reputation, as the 18 plus rated hero, so, what she wouldn't do, wasn't exactly the best indicator for what she didn't want them doing. For all he knew, she would be fine with a giant class A orgy happening. Sounds awesome, but honestly, he might not even show up, right now, he must be really tired from the internship. Knowing him, he is going to be ignoring how tired he is, and training right now. Mina pointed out a big flaw in their plan. What are we going to do at the party anyway? Mina wanted to know what she was signing up for. Kyoka blushed a little and tapped her jacks together. Well. We were going to have a barbecue, maybe some swimming, just a pool party kind of thing. Nothing big or anything. Kyoka didn't want to make everyone prepare for something huge, and she was sure Naruto would be fine with anything really. She just wanted to show her appreciation, and she had something special prepared for Naruto, a small gift from her that was apart from the party. Yeah, Naruto got me a really cool internship with Gajalo, and I learned a lot. I'm going to be baking a really tasty cake for him, and Aoyama is bringing, cheese, and hopefully non-alcoholic wine. Sato walked by her door with several shopping bags filled with cooking ingredients. He was going to spend the rest of his time until the party, making and decorating the cake. He hadn't really gotten any good offers from any heroes, so Naruto wrote him a recommendation letter so that he could work under Gajalo. Koji followed after, nodding his head. He had gotten no offers, and Naruto had gotten him an internship under the wild, wild pussycats. As weird as it had been, he had learned what kind of hero he wanted to be. He didn't want to be a big city hero, he wanted to use his animal-based quirk to help people who got hurt in nature. He wanted to use his abilities to seek and rescue survivors of dangerous accidents. Cheese, cake, and barbecue, well cheese and barbecue go well together. What can I help with? Mina didn't really understand what she could provide. She couldn't cook, she could dance and stuff, but... Just help setting you. Kirishima is already working on keeping Naruto busy, right Kirishima? Kyoka asked with a look to the red-haired boy. She knew that he knew how to distract Naruto better than anyone else among them. As best brothers, that much was to be expected of him. He gave her a thumbs up. Deku and Yurika are on it right now, I told them just how to get Naruto to chase them, and the best way to avoid getting caught. With Deku and Okako. Come back here you son of a bitch. Naruto's shouts of anger only fueled a large figure, standing taller than a normal person, who was wearing a heavy black cloak to run even faster than before. This was a horrible idea. Ochako thought as she sat on Izuku's shoulders inside of the cloak. She was holding onto him for dear life, while also using her quirk to make him weight nothing. All that was keeping him on the ground was her own weight, so he was much faster than he usually was. Kirishima had told them the plan to throw Naruto a thank you party when they all started to get back from their internships, and she had wrongly agreed to be the live bait. Also, why was Naruto so angry at them for something so stupid? All she did was take a bite out of an entire Kit Kat bar, without breaking it, and then she tossed the chocolate on the ground in front of Naruto, before she got Deku to stomp on it to pieces. Legs, please don't fail me now. Izuku prayed to any and all gods out there. He was pretty sure that Naruto, when he caught them, was going to beat the ever-loving shit out of them until he realized they were his friends. Mina's room. Kit Kat bar. Mina asked Kirishima with a knowing look, who nodded his head with a grin. 
Kit Kat bar. Kyoka had no clue what to make of Mina asking that. Yeah, Kirishima had given Izuku a Kit Kat bar and a list of written instructions, but she didn't know how that would lure out Naruto and keep him busy. Naruto, and I, believe that you can tell a lot about a person by how they eat a Kit Kat bar. Also, when Naruto had been injured by that Himiko girl dash, Kirishima chose to ignore Mina's angry growl at the name. Naruto gained a small issue with people who bite it before breaking it. I told those two to bite it, and then throw it on the ground and stomp it, knowing Naruto, he'll get a flashback of Himiko and chase them. Kirishima knew full well he had just thrown Ochako and Izuku to their doom, but he had also given them instructions on how to evade Naruto for long enough for them to get their party set up. Wait, there is a way to evade Naruto. Mina didn't know about this. This would be great for her to know. It's easy, when Naruto gets angry, but not super angry, sometimes he forgets to use his quirk. Once Naruto remembers to use his quirk, Deku and Yuriko are screwed, so we need to get this party set up before then. Kirishima didn't give her anything useful. She didn't intend on angering him like that. Oh well, a party was a party. Maybe this time, the world wouldn't be put in danger. Chapter 61 Heroes Across Time PT2 it was hard not to smile. I can't wait to play this song for him. Kyoka smiled to herself as she thought on the song she had created just for Naruto, to show her thanks to him, and hopefully make some amends for what she had done. Since it was a pool party, she was already adorned in her swimsuit, a rather average one on her at least. Since she lacked the same curve as the other girls, while she looked cute, Kyoka noticed the boys in the class were sending more glances at the others than her. Even Tsuyu, in her skin covering one piece stripped suit was getting looks, since the shortest girl in the class had some rather surprising curves on her. Momo, the girl with the largest boobs but the most reserved personality, was actually wearing the bikini that covered less than her own. Thanks Shoji. Toru shouted out as she sat on Shoji's shoulders, and hung the streamers on the fence's top. As one of the tallest in the class, it was helpful having him around to set up the higher stuff. Not everyone was helping though. The girls are all so hot. Denki thought with eyes trained on the girls. Unlike the other guys, who mostly had their libidos under control, Denki had actually paused what he was doing to watch Mina and Momo as the bent over to pick up inflatable balls. The two of them were setting up blowing up a bunch of pool balls to use in some sort of game. Move your ass faster idiot. Bakugo, Bakugo shouted as even he was trying to give some strange assistance towards the party. He and Denki were simply setting the grills out of any place that could be splashed by water and ruined. Move your ass, or get blown up. Jeez, I thought you hated Naruto after he creamed you. Denki grumbled. Why was Bakugo even here? Of course I hate that fox-faced bastard, but when I blast his ass to pieces, I want him to be able to fight at his best. Unstressed. It won't be a win if he is unable to lose at his strongest. Bakugo's hands exploded as he shouted it out. He blew the grill clear away from them, into many pieces. He looked at what he had done, and simply scoffed. Hey, shit quirk, make another grill. Bakugo shouted over to Momo, who blinked. She was the only one who could make objects, so was he talking to her. Sure. Momo, after a couple of seconds of mental prep, popped a grill out of her body for Bakugo and Denki to replace the broken one. Shit quirk. So anyway, apparently, after the finals happen, Naruto is taking a week-long training trip out of country. Mina continued to conversation she had been having with Momo before Bakugo shouted at them. She blew up an actual balloon this time, and tied it off before she tossed it on the ground. Momo created another balloon with her quirk for her, and blew up one herself. I planned on taking a trip with my parents around that time as well, but it figures Naruto would be going on a training trip, knowing that man. Momo didn't doubt that Naruto was going to be doing that. Finals were a bit away at the moment, but after that they would have a short summer break before school's next semester restarted. Though, I was also thinking on taking a trip to I Island, since my father holds a large amount of stock there. Momo casually stated. Mina's face went flat. Is she accidentally bragging about being rich, but she is so bubbly about it, I can't find it in me to be angry. Mina knew Momo meant nothing about it, but damn, the girl was so rich. She, 
Tenya, and Naruto were apparently all something of rich kids in the class. Tenya and Naruto came from hero families, while Momo was simply from a high-class background. Yet, all three of them were pretty down-to-earth, so it was hard to guess they were rich when they didn't let it slip. Oh yeah, I'm going with Naruto on that trip, we're going to Island 44, the Forest of Death, for survival training, isn't that right Tsuyu? Kirishima called out to the girl, who was in the water, setting up two hoops. She looked towards him, having heard the loud boy's comment. She nodded. Ribbit. Island 44. Isn't that a restricted island? Only the owner of the island can give people permission, the last time I checked, that island was owned by the clan Uzu, Ma, Ki. Momo suddenly felt really stupid when she realized that she had just stated Naruto's last name. While not famous or anything, the Uzumaki family, before people with quirks became the majority, had been a traditional family that owned their own island. Now, Island 44, was just an island where animals with quirks were dropped off, to prevent them from hurting people. The most dangerous animals in the world lived on that island, called it their home, and their prison. Island 44 was all that remained of the Uzumaki legacy, so everyone just forgot about the Uzumaki after several generations of quirk users sprouted up. He owns an island. Mina shouted out in shock when she heard that her boyfriend, her ever-loving boyfriend, owned his own fucking island that he was apparently keeping a secret from her. He told you about it. Mina shouted as she pointed at Tsuyu and Kirishima. Tsuyu raised an hand in defense. I overheard him talking with Kirishima, and asked if I could come. Tsuyu made that point rather simple. He invited me to train with him, that, shouldn't surprise you. Kirishima pointed out in a deadpan, since he and Naruto trained together all the time since they became friends. Naruto inviting him to train together on an island, that was to be expected. It was also a dangerous island, so it wasn't like it would often come up in conversation, so Naruto never really had the chance to state it. Seriously, how many times did any of them actually ask Naruto about his family? Everyone would know this stuff if they just bothered to ask Naruto about it. Mina deflated. Okay, fair enough, not mad anymore. Mina grinned when she realized she was getting worked up over nothing. She and Naruto almost never trained together, it just wasn't something the two of them liked to do together as a couple. It made sense Naruto wouldn't tell her that he was inviting Kirishima to his secret island. I wish my costume could show this much skin, it's so easy to make objects like this. Momo stated to herself as she created multiple party poppers from different parts of her body. She started to fill up a small bucket with them, and looked at her bikini. Mina and Kirishima gave her deadpan looks. With your body, you'll make things awkward for the people you save. Your costume is already risque enough. Kirishima didn't have the heart to say it out loud though. It would ruin the girl's fighting spirit if she heard that if she showed any more skin, she would just be causing everyone, males at least, problems with her supermodel-like body. Mina could practically sense his thoughts. Yeo Momo. I'm going to be completely honest, for a lot of guys who saw you on TV in the sports festival, with your bra showing, you're already FAP material. If you want to be known as the Fanzer Vice Hero Dash. Did somebody say Team Fanzer Vice? Toru came into the conversation with an excited tone. Was Team Fanzer Vice, her idea, becoming a real thing? With Naruto. Fucking D.E.K.U. Ah. He's channeling Kukin. Deku shouted as he ran with Ochako holding onto his back. The cloak covering them had fallen off in their run, and showed who they were. Instead of Naruto calming down at seeing them, he just went into a deeper anger. Now, he was chasing them fast enough that Deku was pushing himself to his upper limit just to not get caught by Naruto. Akako was holding on with fearful eyes. He looks like he's going to Kancho us. Run faster Deku, I don't want to be but hurt. Ochako screamed, before she yelped when she nearly took several fingers to the ass. She climbed up higher on Deku and grabbed his hair, pulling it a little to try and make her stead run faster. Deku was practically crying. Why did we have to be the distraction? At the party. Bakugo smiled. Fucking Deku. I feel like something bad is going to happen to him. Bakugo couldn't help this slightly happy feeling he felt. Also, 
Who is the skinny fuck? Bakugo looked over at the oldest person at the pool, some skeletal-looking blonde man with oversized clothes. The guy was wearing an oversized one-piece, similar to Tsuyu's in design. Naruto's uncle, apparently. Yagi something. Denki had heard Mina talking with the man when he arrived at the party. He had never really seen the man, so he didn't know what to say about him, other than he was Naruto's family or something. Everyone stopped what they were doing when a bright light appeared in the middle of the pool, bright enough to blind all of them. Splash. Oh come on, Murphy, why can't we have one special event like this, without you flipping us off with a villain? Mina dropped to her knees and shouted to the heavens. Once the bright lights in her eyes calmed down, she was sure she was going to come face to face with a supervillain who wanted to conquer the world. The Naruto factor was way too strong, they were throwing a party for Naruto, and had attracted some kind of villain to it. Thankfully, they had Todoroki and Bakugo, two strong guys with them right now. Bakugo didn't need to wait, the second he heard the word villain, he jumped into action and exploded towards the figure that emerged out of the water. He aimed both of his hands at the source of the splash as a blonde head of hair came out of the water. Attacking me like this, seriously Bakugo. Guess the rewinding smash and fast forward flash did this when they combined. Die. Wow, attacking me with an explosion right off the bat, and a strong one, too bad I'm alright, huh. Alright spoke as he used the back of his hand and knocked away the explosion, by redirecting his hands into the air. All right took a few steps out of the pool and he shook the water out of the fur that covered his body, before patting himself down. Before Bakugo could do anything, All right flicked him in the forehead and sent him flying right into the pool himself. Hmm? Well, 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 looks like this is really the past then, calm down everyone. All right spoke as he raised his hands up. Toshinori looked at the scene with a dropped jaw and wide eyes. All right transformed back. It was an adult Naruto, his body had filled out and matured to full adulthood. His hair was shorter to keep out of his eyes, and he had some scruff on his face, he had forgotten to shave that morning, as well as his body's muscles more developed a little if that was possible. His jawline was more pronounced than before, and his eyes showed the same playfulness as always, but with even more experience behind them. All jaws dropped. With Naruto. Oh crap, I'll make you all better like me. All better shouted when she looked at who she had crushed, she had dropped out of the air, and landed right dab on top of her own father figure. Naruto was laying on the ground, face first, as All Better placed her hands together and tried to plead forgiveness. Even as the wound on Naruto's forehead healed up, and both Izuku and Ochako stopped running, they all looked at the costumed girl that was healing Naruto's wounds. Uh. Who are you? Izuku questioned her with some appropriate caution. Naruto attracted danger to him, this girl could be dangerous. She smiled and stood up proudly. I'm the hero who heals the body and heart with a smile on her face. I'm the future successor to my father, the apprentice hero All Better. All Better took up a pose, bending forward with a stuck out tongue. Instead of a heroic pose, she chose a far more cute one. All. Better. Chapter 62 Heroes Across Time PT3 how are you an adult already? I forgot how stupid she is. All right, adult Naruto, thought to himself as he cleaned out his ear, hearing Mina shouting at him in shock. He was surrounded by all of his friends in their teenage bodies, so it hadn't been hard for him to figure out that fast forward and rewind had counteracted each other in a way that caused a small break in time slash space. Two time quirks interacting like that violently was to be expected, the quirks would have naturally tried to rip each other apart. Forward and rewind couldn't happen at the same time, naturally, so time couldn't handle the stress of it, and simply broke. Naruto. Wow. I guess at this point, he hasn't been healed to his prime yet. All Right looked up and down Toshinori, who was in his true form, which was different than what All Right was used to. He didn't mention it though, since if Toshinori had this as his true form, then the world didn't know that he was All Might yet. It would be better to mention this in private. Time travel, about 10 years from now, my intern used her rewind quirk and it interacted badly with a villain who had a fast forward quirk. Naruto explained the situation to Mina to answer her question. Everyone who heard that seemed to kind of accept it. Is this like a paradox timeline, 
where everything you do and tell us is predestined, or is this like a branching timeline, where your actions will create a new future? Momo was the smartest for a reason. She wanted to know if it was safe to interact with Naruto as he was, or if they needed to avoid him for the safety of their own timeline. With a paradox timeline, nothing adult Naruto did would change his past, so everything he told them was predestined to happen. In that case, it would be horrible to hear something that would be nasty for them. Hearing of one of their deaths, or a horrible injury, would be heartbreaking. In a branching timeline, nothing adult Naruto did would change his future, meaning that he couldn't change his future, but he would be able to change their own future. His influence could change the rivers of time for the better or worse, depending completely on how they all reacted to his changes. Mina just poked all right in the stomach, not listening to anything. I can't help but look at him, and feel this sense of pride. Toshinori stayed silent and smiled. His nephew seemed like a fine adult, a true pro hero. It doesn't matter, I don't plan on staying in the past long. The world is in danger dash. Oh come on. Mina screamed when she heard that line. Dash, you done. All right asked when he stopped for her outburst. He could understand her frustration, but she didn't need to shout in his ear. Most of the class were palming their faces. It was like every time the world was in danger, Naruto was somehow in the middle of it all. I think we all deserve an explanation. Toshinori stepped forward and tried to take control of the situation. All right wasn't having it. The man who sent us to the past has a device that can amplify quirks, and no doubt, with my luck he's going to find a way to get multiple quirks. With Menma. Now this is certainly interesting, this device is still being developed on I Island, how strange for a completed version to exist. Here I thought only David Shield was smart enough to make this. How fortunate I found you, not to mention fast forward is quite the unique quirk. Menma spoke as he looked at the invention that Nariko was holding in her hands. A man had teleported into the middle of their base, so it was only natural that he get punished accordingly for his trespassing. Nariko was just smiling to herself as she watched the blood on her hand drip onto the floor, having clawed the man across the chest after he hit her with one of those weird attacks. How, your quirk, how? The man was quickly aging, having his own quirk turned against him as he grew older against his will. His aging slowed down, before he stopped when he was close to 70 or so years old. Menma looked impassive the entire time, but not without a keen glance downwards. Ha ha ha. Brother is a genius, there isn't a quirk on this world that he can't find the weakness of. His brains, and my monster strength, makes us unstoppable. Nariko giggled out, drunk on the pleasure of being on a fresh hunt. The man had been far too easy for her to take down, but blood was blood. Menma leaned down and stared him in the eyes. You're weak, far too weak to make proper use of this brilliant invention, but don't worry. I'm sure that you'll make a fine Noma. Father might even allow you to use this quirk amplifier, you'll be the strongest Noma he's ever created. Menma looked at the man with nothing short of disdain. The man had been so arrogant as to assume that just because they were teenagers, that he could beat them with his amplified quirk. Coward. Only picking a fight with those he was certain he could beat, those who looked or acted weaker than him. I can't kill him. Nariko seemed sad when she heard that. She wanted to kill again. Patience, soon an opponent strong enough to fight you will appear. Fast forward sounds like a strong quirk, said it is in the hands of a weak coward. Menma dusted himself off and stood up straight. He didn't want to dirty his hands with the blood of somebody so beneath him. The man was useful as a Noma, a Noma that could be unleashed on the city. Menma hummed to himself. Better idea. Spare me, I'm begging you. I don't want to die. As weak as you are, you do serve a use, so I intend on sparing your life. I'll make sure you become the strongest Noma, even stronger than All Might himself, far stronger than the old strongest Noma. Menma sighed as he placed a finger on the man's head, and teleported him to have his body modified. He was useless if his body couldn't hold at least four or five quirks in it. Even he and Nariko both had three quirks inside of their bodies, their original quirks, and both of them had two additional quirks that were given to them by their father. Nariko seemed bored, now that her fight was over, and the blood was drying on her hands she was once more bored with what was going on. 
Menma was the smart one, with their father having given him a quirk that boosted his IQ up to nearly 500, she was just the strong one, with three quirks made for pure combat. He was the planner, not her, she just went where he told her to do and did what he wanted. I want to fight again. Nariko pouted to herself as kicked a pebble across the floor. Nariko. I'm going to teleport you. Menma spoke as he walked towards her. I'm going to speak with father, but I think it's time that the League of Villains showed that we aren't just a threat to Japan, we need to make a statement that we plan on spreading our villainly worldwide. Menma placed a hand on her head, and she just tilted her head in confusion for a moment. Okay, so shouldn't he ask the new guy Dabi, or Himiko, to go to another country and make a statement, not her? Those two were way smarter than she was, so it was natural that they went on these stealth kill missions. Why? Rampage. Reduce the entire city to nothing, erase all traces of the heroes in the city. Killing Kamui Woods makes a statement, destroying a city will show that we can get results. So. Menma spoke, and every word he spoke just made the smile on Nariko's face grow and grow. All she was good for was murder and violence, so he was telling her something extremely good for her right now. When she saw him show her a kind smile, his care for her evident, she let him rub the top of her head and purred at his touch. I want the blood of heroes and innocent alike to spill. Show this world that the beauty is fading, that their beautiful peace can come crumbling down, show them they need to grow stronger. This world belongs to the strong, and if dash. Teleport me already. I want to rampage. Nariko insisted as she pushed her forehead into his hand. He was preventing he from fighting while he was talking. She vanished into thin air. Menma teleported himself. Father. I have come with news. Menma walked up to his father figure. All for one. A tall, muscular man wearing a pinstripe black suit. His face was uncovered by his usual black mask, showing that his eyes were covered by skin, and he had no hair only scar tissue for the top half of his head. He was a largely well-built man, and gave off a thoughtful, intimidating aura about him. He was strapped down to a chair for the most part, cords in his mouth and a life support system. He took a knee before all for one, and bowed his head to the older man, who simply looked like he was looking in his direction. You've been acting on your own again. All for one pointed out with a knowing tone. He knew. I've been acting for the sake of my own goals, for a world where the strong get to live the way they want. I can promise you, my loyalty is to the League of Villains. Tomura might be my elder, but he has the mentality of a child. My actions dash. I was just stating a fact, you're not being questions. I trusted you with the high intelligence quirk, so that once my time is over, you will replace me and support the League of Villains from the shadows. I have faith in your actions but give me forewarning in the future. All for one spoke with a smirk. He had full faith in Menma's skills in acting the part of the villain. Menma was supporting Tamura, without Tamura being any the wiser to it. In the end, it was for the best, since Tamura wasn't yet ready to become the true leader of the League of Villains. He had much growing up to do before he was ready, and while he was growing, Menma would do what he could from the shadows. Your sister, she isn't with you. All for one didn't usually see one without another. Menma closed his eyes. I deployed her. I sent her to a small city in the UK far enough away from other cities that help will not arrive in time. Once she has laid waste to the city, the world will know of the threat we possess, and they will suspect that our base is in the UK. We will be able to mask our movements, and remain in the shadows with more efficiency if they are unable to track the location of our base. Menma explained where she was. He also explained what she was doing, his reasons behind it, and he gave reason for why it was worth the risk. All for one considered it. Very well, do what you will, a child should be allowed to experiment after all. With Nariko. Music, Evangelion 3.0 Ultimate Soldier. Rampage, Rampage, this is going to be, a bloodbath. Nariko chanted to herself as she looked around, having been teleported to wherever Menma's marker was. Her eyes turned blood red as she looked to see herself in the middle of a city. Everyone that was nearby was looking at her in shock, since she had appeared there out of nowhere. Nariko took a deep breath of the ocean air, the clear blue skies above, 
the smells of thousands upon thousands of human scents in the air. All of her teeth became sharp. Raising her arms into the air, clouds started to gather in the sky as the wind started to rage with more fury. The clouds swirled and started to descend as a tornado began to form, coming down towards her on the ground. When people saw it, it was instant, they started to flee as Nariko began to transform, growing larger, and larger, more and more tails forming behind her as she destroyed the clothes she was wearing. Several tornadoes touched down the ground and ripped apart the closest buildings to her, and her giant fists touched the ground gently as she sat down. Alarms all over the city were already blaring, but the tornadoes started to spread out and rushed towards the edges of the city. She would block all possible escape routes from the city, her mind started to go completely blank as she gave complete control of her body to the beastly desires inside of her. Destroy. The ocean's waves surged towards the city as she waved her tails, commanding the forces of nature and bringing forth natural disasters. Tidal waves destroyed completely the eastern side of the city that she had arrived in, and tornadoes started to destroy all parts of the city they touched. Nariko smashed her large hands into the sides of buildings, smashed them and sent them flying all across the city. The shockwaves of her building smashes destroying the surrounding buildings as well. The ground shook with each attack, and she started to walk on all fours around the city, destroying all things that were in front of her. Destroy it all. Each of her punches destroy massive portions of the city, and created earthquakes that took countless lives. Opening her mouth, she unleashed a powerful torrent of shredding winds that traveled in a straight line, destroying more than 10% of the entire city, leaving nothing but debris in its wake. A large flame hit the side of her chest. She crushed the hero who attacked her without a second thought, and she summoned forth a wave to wash away more of the city. As many heroes with long-range attacks were firing their attacks at her uselessly. All long-range heroes were crushed before her might, all close-range power fighters were swept away by her waves, and ripped to shreds by her winds. It would be minutes before the city was fully destroyed. You won't get any further. A hero with a quirk that allowed him to grow to massive sizes appeared in front of her. He died, she lunged forward and snapped her jaws around his neck without any hesitation, jerking her head from side to side to snap his neck and rip the ribbons of life out from his body. Nariko let loose a roar of victory. In minutes, a city of with many thousands, was reduced to a state of complete ruin. That's it for part 8. Thank you for watching and see you on the next video.